Well, thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction, and it's a great honor to be, to be here. I have to say that uh, my first visit abroad after uh, graduating was in Bonn long ago for four months, and this kind, is a kind of uh, cornerstone in my scientific life. Um, I will talk on uh, the solution, actually the numerical solution of partial differential equations, and, uh, and the key uh, issue here is complexity. So I'm dealing with problems with, uh, uh, which require many resources to be solved uh, because of the intrinsic complexity underlying a physical problem. Uh, and, uh, and, and then I will talk about the way to uh, try to reduce this complexity uh, without, however, uh, compromising the, uh, uh, the meaningfulness of the uh, underlying mathematical model. The guiding example would be circulatory system, although many things that I will say are actually very general. Uh, circulatory system is, a, is an example where you can apply mathematics to solve, hopefully, uh, meaningful problems and useful problems. You start from, uh, from images. Uh, you actually start from data, as everywhere, uh, every time you, you want to, to, to use a mathematical model. And in this case, the data are provided by clinical images. Uh, typically uh, magnetic resonance or a CT scan or X-rays or any other kind of images. Uh, the very first step is to try to uh, reconstruct the geometry you want to solve, for instance, the uh, blood in a specific uh, environment, say in the aorta. Uh, then you have to build up the geometry of the aorta for that specific patient, say. Then you have to use mathematical models to describe the physics, in this case fluid dynamics and the interaction between the fluid and the, and the vessel wall for instance. Then you need numerical methods to uh, actually project these infinite dimensional equations upon finite dimensional subspaces and you have to generate finite dimensional problems by, by using typically Galerkin projection but not only that. And, uh, and eventually you want to show that what you've been dealing with is uh, somehow useful and meaningful and, uh, and then back to the clinics. This is the typical example where you to, to use mathematical models. There's another one, which is to try to uh, uh, train surgeons through the virtual surgery. And, uh, and, and, and another one uh, is uh, helping uh, optimizing uh, prosthetic devices. So find solving uh, optimal shape design for, for prosthetic implants. Um, the, um, the model is basically uh, conceived uh, locally for a specific environment and then you want to scale, scale it up to go to the global view, and uh, you want to integrate local and global models, and, uh, and eventually you want to reduce the complexity by model reduction. So I'll go through these uh, uh, steps, and uh, so let me start with uh, a kind of baseline computation. Uh, this is the um, carotid bifurcation. The carotid artery is uh, in our neck. We have two carotids, one on the left and one on the right. And, uh, and the bifurcate and the internal carotid uh, branch, this one, uh, brings blood to the brain. Now, it typically happens, or it may happen, that if the blood, for instance, is too fat, there is too cholesterol, say, uh, too much cholesterol, then, uh, then you may have what is called the uh, atherosclerosis, meaning the formation of a plaque. And this, unfortunately, is quite common. Uh, and uh, it's also quite common, unfortunately, that people uh, die because of circulatory uh, troubles and uh, actually the uh, uh, the natural deaths, uh, the deaths due to natural causes, not to accidents. Say, uh, for more than 50 percent, are due to cardiovascular diseases. Say, so that's why medical doctors are so uh, in interested in this type of analysis. And uh, and what you can provide is uh, is a new, a fresh insight. Uh, you can provide quantitative data. Uh, for instance, in this case. Uh, what you see here are the uh, velocity profiles at different sections, at different cross-sections of the artery. And, uh, and what you see here is a wavelet, which is the uh, uh, peak. This is the uh, uh, flow rate at uh, the inflow of the carotid, uh, which is basically dictated by the heartbeat. So this is uh, what you get by solving a partial differential equation. In this case, is the Navier-Stokes equations for, uh, for incompressible viscous fluid. So we are modeling in this case blood flow as an incompressible viscous fluid in this artery. It's a big artery, so you can assume this, uh, uh, um, can assume blood to be a, 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 a fluid, 
even though uh, this is not strictly speaking the case because blood is made of different constituents. You have a plasma and then, uh, and then you have red particles and uh, white particles and, and, and platelets, uh, but in large arteries it behaves like, like a Newtonian fluid. So this uh, is the result of the simulation of a single heartbeat uh, by using Navistock's equations on an artery. Um, and these are the equations. Uh, you have uh, uh, three different fields here. Uh, the first, the second, and the third one. Now, uh, the innermost one is the fluid dynamics. So these are the Navistock's equations are, I was mentioning before, uh, meaning that you have one equation for a conservation of momentum, and this is a Newton law, force equal to mass time acceleration. Uh, and the second one is the continuity, of, of, uh, is the continuity equation, uh, which means conservation of mass. So divergence of UF equal to zero. UF is the velocity field of the fluid. Uh, P is the pressure. And then, and then you have boundary conditions, say. Uh, you have a second equation, which is this one. This is for the structure. What is the structure? Is the, is the vessel wall that deforms, right? It's compliant, uh, so it's not rigid. Uh, it deforms under the action of the heartbeat. So when you have a pressure wave that propagate, uh, you have a transfer of energy from blood to the structure. And then you have dilation. And, uh, and uh, during the diastolic peak, you have that uh, the uh, structure returns the energy to the fluid, and, uh, and then you have complexion, say. Uh, so these are equations of elastodynamics. Uh, they can be arbitrarily complex. Depends on uh, the type of tissue you want to, uh, to describe. So that's why you have typically an assumption that the material is hyperelastic. It's, uh, it could be isotropic. We use the isotropic um, a constitutive uh, assumption for LT vessels. Uh, we use a transversely isotropic where you have unhealthy vessels, so you have fibers that are more respondent in terms of uh, transferring the, uh, uh, reacting to the elasticity, say. And then uh, you may have orthotropic, like in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the myocardium, because of the presence of the uh, uh, fibers and the sheets. So depending upon the specific tissue you are, you are targeting, you may use different type of uh, elastic uh, equations and, uh, and constitutive, constitutive laws. And then you have a third field, which is the ge geometry field. Uh, actually, blood is uh, contained into the lumen, and the lumen changes over time in an unknown way. So this is a further unknown, and this is the geometry. Geometry means, in this case, the reconstruction of the, uh, of the three-dimensional volume where uh, blood is actually flowing. So you have geometry, fluid, and structure, and they're coupled together through these red equations, and the red equations are there to, sorry, the red equations are there to express the, the dynamic condition, namely that the forces are in equilibrium, the uh, uh, kinematic condition, namely that the velocity is continuous at the endothelium interface. If you have a blood particle hitting the endothelium interface, it should stick there because of the hypothesis, hypothesis of uh, blood viscosity, and, uh, and eventually you have a condition of adherence uh, which, which is uh, supported by this uh, geometry field. So this is a, co uh, is a coupled three-field uh, system of partial differential equations. They are nonlinear, they are time-dependent, and, uh, and of course there is no, unfortunately, no theorem uh, that states that uh, under physiological conditions this system has a unique solution. So there's plenty of room for analysis here to provide uh, a, a results, theoretical results for this type of system. And still the solution exists, fortunately for us. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we, 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 we need to find it out through numerical methods. Um, you can make, of course, some simplifications uh, in the assumptions and, uh, and then eventually get a, a, a result of uh, existence and uniqueness and. Uh, and, uh, and, and stability for this type of problem, but not if you really consider the problem in its uh, 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 real complexity. So um, the, um, this problem is uh, just one example of what is called today a multi-physics problem. You have different type of physics, say. Uh, this is in particular is a fluid structure interaction multi-physics multi problem. You have the fluid, you have the structure, and you have the, uh, the geometry, and they're coupled together uh, through this uh, uh, interface condition, say. See, this is uh, uh, one example of solution. You see the same carotid artery uh, as you have seen before with the bifurcation. Now, just for graphical purposes, we ask, we are, we're taking a, 
uh, 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 section, a longitudinal section, just to see what's happening here. Uh, the colors refer to the intensity of the velocity field. The arrows are the velocity um, uh, vectors. And, uh, and here you see the deformation of our artery in physiological, physiological conditions. This is yet another example. This is a sail that deforms under the action of the wind. This is another fluid structure interaction problem. In this case, of course, the structure is no longer uh, the, the biological tissue. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tissue. It's another kind of tissue, say. So the dynamics is completely different. And of course, you have similar kind of problems when you consider um, the interaction between uh, uh, acoustic waves and, uh, and, uh, and the deformation of a, on a, stru of a structure, uh, of, or you have electromagnetic waves uh, that propagate in a fluid, and so on and so forth. So in all those cases, you have this type of coupled structure. And, uh, and this is what actually counts from the numerical point of view. How do you solve it? How do you solve this monster problem? Um, and there are two typical approaches, or two typical uh, philosophies, say. One is uh, what is called a monolithic solver. Uh, monolithic means that uh, you take the old system, you uh, approximate it, so you make it into a, a numerical discretization, and then you have uh, a finite dimensional uh, nonlinear algebraic system of millions of uh, equations and millions of unknowns, say, and, and then you solve it at once. Uh, that's very complicated. I mean, if you can succeed in doing that, uh, this is great because you don't have any issue of stability, say. But this is very complicated. This is very challenging. Um, another approach is what is called the partitioned approach or segregated approach. You try to take advantage of the different components because the different components express different type of physics. So you want to solve uh, at every single step just one physic, physics, one after the other. Now, if you do that, for instance, you solve the fluid first and then the structure and then the geometry, unfortunately, what you end up with is, a, is an iterative method that will never converge. And this you can prove it analytically, that you cannot have convergence in this case for this specific type of application. So a fully partition algorithm will, 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 not, will not work. Uh, so the idea is to rather use a partition uh, approach at the level of preconditioning. So you solve your problem monolithically, but you have to precondition it. Preconditioning means using a scaling operator, scaling differential operator. And the scaling differential operator can have a partition structure. It should be well conceived because uh, you want it to be efficient. Uh, you want it to be spectrally equivalent somehow with uh, the full operator. And this is the uh, difficult part of the story. So I will hide completely all these difficulties, numerical difficulties. Let me just show one possible result. Uh, this is uh, important for uh, for computational science, uh, you typically solve these problems on a big supercomputer with different processors, many different CPU cells. So in this case, we are using a computer with 24,000 CPUs, but you can go much higher. And we are solving a problem which requires about 150,000 millions of degrees of freedom, namely of numerical unknowns to express the physics of the problem. And um, this is the ideal scalability curve, which is linear, Meaning that if you have a problem, the problem, uh, you solve it on a, just one computer, it will take, say, one hour. If you use, instead of one computer, 60 CPUs, you like it to take one minute, and so on and so forth. This will be linear scalability. This is ideal, but in practice, since your problem is coupled all together, you cannot break it artificially because the, the solution is interconnected, is a partial differential equation. So this requires a lot of work, and this is the, uh, the domain of the, uh, say, high-performance computing and large-scale computation. But with the precondition, precondition that we have developed, you see here that we covered practically the ideal scalability. Uh, this is essential if you want to address complicated problems like this one, for instance. What you see here, is the ascending aorta. Still another patient, uh, still healthy in this case. Um, this is, uh, perhaps you can see the time below here. We go from one to, uh, sorry, from zero to 1.8 seconds, uh, meaning that you are covering two heartbeats, real heartbeats. So you see here we are at the end of the first heartbeat. 
is the, the historic phase. This is historic phase. There's a hard compression again. Uh, you see the streamlines here, and uh, you see the streak lines there, and you see the deformation of the artery outside. So this is the ascending aorta. Sorry. This is the ascending aorta. So this is the, uh, the one that is... Uh, sorry for that. Uh, this is the one that is uh, facing the uh, left ventricle. Uh, so this is where you have the highest uh, flow rate and the most important dynamics. Actually, this is one of the few places in our body where the flow can get not really turbulent, but unsteady, even in physiological conditions. Uh, so this is a very complicated computation. Uh, two heartbeats take for uh, about a couple of weeks on a big supercomputer, one of the biggest at the European scale, say. Um, so if, if from one end, this is inevitable because you want to really catch the real dynamics that no X-ray, no MRI, no CT scan could capture. Uh, on the other side, uh, this is still at the level of academic interest because if you want to get a doctor involved, you need to provide him or her with uh, much faster solutions. So that's this one of the challenges. Uh, how can you get the same type of quality at a much, much, much lower uh, compute with much lower computational time. Okay, so this is a possible solution. It's a possible strategy. Um, uh, first of all, we want to go uh, to a larger scale because uh, we have seen so far the simulation in a region which is very small, a few centimeters, but in fact, uh, this uh, carotid artery or this ascending aorta, they are not isolated. They are connected with the old system. How do you connect them with the old system? You cannot replicate the same type of partial differential equations everywhere because, because we are made of uh, hundreds of large arteries and uh, millions of small arteries and, uh, and the 10 to the power 17 capillaries. So there's no way to use PDEs in the old system. So we have to simplify things. And uh, this is the way we simplify. We, we use this geometric multiscale. And uh, this means that we are prolongating our three-dimensional computation by one-dimensional analysis. We'll see it later on. Uh, so we have to devise one-dimensional uh, PDEs uh, that are, however, capable of uh, capturing uh, the most important, uh, most essential uh, behavior of blood flow in, in large arteries. Uh, we call it sequential multiscale because 1D is following here our 3D. And, uh, and, and please be aware of the fact that the connection here is, is through a single point. So we have to transfer all the physical information through a single point. So the interface condition is a single point, a zero measure. So this is very difficult. Uh, this is another example. This is the circle of Willis, which is embedded in, uh, into our brain. What you see here is a reconstruction of our brain. And the circle of Willis is made of uh, uh, vessels that uh, uh, dispatch blood coming from uh, heart to the, to the brain. And now we are using here one-dimensional analysis for all these channels, even though these are three-dimensional objects, of course. So here again, we are computing uh, one-dimensional uh, PDEs embedded into three-dimensional PDEs. And the surface of contact in this case is the external surface of these one-dimensional channels, which does not exist. This is a mathematical idealization. So we have to uh, uh, find some suitable uh, Dirac uh, information, data masses that are distributed along these uh, surfaces to transfer information from the inside to the outside. Uh, here is uh, the cartoon for the uh, geometric multiscale. We want to use three-dimensional analysis where we actually want to capture the real physics. And then we use one-dimensional analysis for the most important arteries and veins that you see, that you see here, the red and the blues. And when you go to the level of uh, the peripheral uh, uh, circulation, then you have the capillaries, the green points over there, the green lines, and there not even the one-dimensional analysis is affordable. So there we have to use zero-dimensional analysis. Zero-dimensional analysis means that there is no space any longer, there's just time, and uh, then we have systems of ordinary differential equations. So we are coupling 3D PDEs with 1D PDEs with the 0D PDEs. And uh, here is the way it works. We start from 3D Navistokes plus elastodynamics, then we made some suitable simplification to end up with the 1D uh, equations here. And when you go to the level of capillaries, we use the analogy with electrical systems, with electrical circuits, say. And we have zero-dimensional zero -dimensional models. Of course, you have to make assumptions. 
as, as, uh, as obvious and as customary when you have to model a specific phenomenon. You make assumptions that are physically based, and you go from the 3D to the 1D. And surprisingly enough, this was mentioned this morning also, uh, you end up with the Euler equations of gas dynamics. So Euler himself, uh, in, in, uh, in 1775, was professor at, uh, of anatomy at the University of Basel, professor of anatomy there. And, uh, and of course, he was interested in understanding uh, uh, physical uh, phenomena. In particular, he, he, he derived, for the first time in the history, a model for blood circulation in a cylindrical vessel. Right? So uh, these are one-dimensional equations. And uh, as you can perhaps recognize the fact that you have the continuity of mass, the continuity of momentum, and then you have a constitutive law. And now, in this case, uh, the, um, the, the first equation has, well, this system has two unknowns, actually. The flow rate, the average flow rate, and uh, the um, A, which is the area of uh, the one-dimensional vessel that is actually uh, moving, uh, it's actually complying. Um, this, this is the same mathematical structure as the celebrated Euler equations for gas dynamics, even though they are, in this context, applied to a completely different type of of situation. And then still you simplify and you end up with uh, this uh, electrical circuit analogy. And, uh, and in this case, you have a system of ordinary differential equations for the average pressure and the average flow rate. Of course, there is a correspondence between the two, the two, uh, the two categories, the two words. In fluid dynamics, the pressure has become the voltage. Uh, the flow rate is the current. The blood viscosity is the resistance. The blood inertia is the inductance and wall comprises the capacitance. But Modulo this type of interpretation, uh, you can regard now the capillary behavior uh, in terms of fluid dynamics as if they were uh, part of electrical systems. By so doing, we can, uh, we can afford solving the circulation everywhere in our body. Uh, the very first step is to use the one-dimensional analysis. And by doing that, we are using a patchwork of uh, Euler equations um, the components are the most important arteries in our, in our body. We have, in this specific model, 103 arteries. Say each artery is characterized by specific geometrical and physical parameters. And uh, then we patch them together by using uh, the other equations in every single piece and then enforcing at the junctions the continuity of the total pressure as well as the conservation of mass. Now, you end up with a system which is a system of um, of uh, hyperbolic and nonlinear hyperbolic equations, and uh, you can show that uh, you have uh, uh, existence of solution. You have also uniqueness of solution. There are no shock waves, uh, fortunately, in our body, and uh, this is also reflected by this analysis. You don't have shock waves, even though the system is a nonlinear hyperbolic system, because because there is no time enough to develop for a shock wave because of the pulsatility of blood, and also because of the cur curvature. So there is no space enough to develop. Um, so you can solve this problem. And having a reasonable picture of, of what's happening in our body, in the, in the most important arteries of our body, we see here represented, say, the, uh, the flow rate and the pressure in the different compartment. But uh, and, and the, at, the, at the end, uh, you have these uh, electrical circuits that are there to close the system, to account for the peripheral resistances, for instance. And, uh, and the, the picture, the global picture, is that we want to use this 1D model uh, as a background descriptor, but then we want to overlay it with uh, three-dimensional models where we actually need to, to see much more in detail what's happening. So it's like having different mathematical lenses. One is, more, one is coarser, the other is finer, and, uh, and, and this means interplaying uh, 3D, 1D, and 0D objects, say. Uh, this is one example of application. Uh, this is the uh, aorta that you have seen before. Now it is connected with the one-dimensional system of arteries. And in particular, what you see is that in the inflow and outflow, you don't see any spurious reflection, meaning that the physics there is simulated correctly. So you have the right continuities of the relevant, of the relevant variables. OK. So this is for the circulation. But, but then you miss the, the ba basic engine, which is the heart. And the heart is, uh, is a kind of complicated uh, unit. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, from the mathematical standpoint, you have different components. Uh, first of all, you have uh, 
the electrophysiology because you have an electrical signal that activates the uh, propagation of an electrical wave on, in, on the myo myocardium through the, uh, a network of fibers that are called the Purkinje fibers. Then this triggers the deformation of every single cell that can delay or contract. And uh, through a kind of homogenization, you have a global contraction or dilation of the whole organ, the whole uh, heart. Now, uh, this determines the contraction of the ventricles and the atria. Uh, and in particular, you have the ejection of blood uh, from the ventricle uh, during the uh, uh, systolic peak. And, uh, and you have the uh, intaking of blood uh, from the atria during the diastolic peak. So uh, from a macroscopic uh, viewpoint, uh, you have partial differential equation for the electrophysiology. You have ordinary differential equation to describe the bio chemistry at the single, at, at, the, at, the, at the every uh, single uh, cells. Then you have uh, the elastodynamic to account for uh, the uh, deformation of the myocardium. Uh, then you have uh, the partial differential equations for uh, the fluid dynamics inside the ventricles. So you have the electrical field, the biochemical field, the structural field, and, uh, and the uh, uh, fluid dynamics field. Of course, it's a multi-scale problem because uh, you have uh, 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 different scales in space and time. You have different scales in space because uh, remember that we want to end up with a global circulation which takes uh, place at the level of, uh, of, the, of the full body. Uh, then uh, we want to describe what's happening in the heart. So this is a few centimeters. Then you go to the, uh, to the level of the, 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 the single fibers and, and sheets. Uh, and then to the level of the single cells and the sarcomeres. And the sarcomere is the most uh, say, uh, the smallest unit, uh, physiological unit in the heart, uh, and is, uh, the, the, the size is uh, of the order of uh, 0.002 millimeters. So there's a big span of, uh, of uh, scales, and uh, in, in, uh, in time is even uh, more demanding because uh, you have that the, uh, the calcium, uh, uh, the, cal the polarized calcium ions uh, which produce waves, uh, these are are uh, taking place at uh, uh, every uh, uh, millisecond, say. Then you have the depolarization, which is one uh, of the order of, of the tenth of a second. The cardiac cycle is, roughly speaking, one second. And then the metabolic response takes for uh, weeks, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, uh, several weeks. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you are interested in considering the pathology that may eventually arise. And this takes place over a, a time span, which is the life cycle. Um, how can you combine all these scales in the uh, model and in the numerical simulation? This is extremely, extremely difficult. It's a very open problem. There are a few uh, groups in the world working on that, try to combine the old things. And, um, and the results are very promising. We are not yet at the level of understanding uh, of capturing the old physics of the heart uh, functioning. But, but I think that the uh, the basic understanding, the basic mathematical uh, comprehension is, uh, is already there. Uh, in mathematical terms, uh, we have uh, PDEs for uh, the electrophysiology. Uh, these are, uh, this is a system of uh, nonlinear reaction diffusion equations for the um, transmembrane electric potential. Uh, we have the ionic currents uh, that are, uh, passes through the cell membranes, and this is a system of ordinary differential equations. Then we have the active, active contraction of the cardiomyocytes. These are elastodynamics equations, say. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the ventricular fluid dynamics, still regulated by Navier-Stokes equations. And of course, you have all these uh, uh, systems coupled together. Uh, from a macroscopic viewpoint, this is a, this is a real art uh, beating. Uh, the, uh, be the behavior is characterized by large deformation, large forces, uh, instantaneous forces and, uh, and the synchronization, so the four chambers. You have the two atria and the two, and the two ventricles, and you have several um, uh, valves that are uh, uh, regulating the passage of the fluid between uh, the four, among the four, the four uh, atria, uh, the two atria and the, and, the two, and the two ventricles, the four chambers, say. Then you have the interaction with the surrounding tissue. The heart is actually not in the empty space, it's immersed in a, a so called pericardial fluid without any rigid support. So it's moving uh, without being rigidly fixed to any support, say. 
Um, and uh, the typical contraction pattern includes the 20, 30 percent of longitudinal shortening. The heart is shortening for every single heartbeat. We'll see an example in a, in a little while. And uh, the 30, 40 percent of wall thickening at peak systole. So the, the myocardium is uh, dilating by 40 percent of its uh, diameter. So it's a big displacement at every heartbeat. Uh, and of course, you have then the valves that are opening. So here is a, is a virtual, uh, say, an academic ventricle that you see the way it deforms from, uh, uh, you have a lateral view and uh, in the top view, and you actually see that those numbers that was the sphere that was mentioned before are actually respected by this model. So this is a kind of uh, uh, beta testing. Uh, you start from a model for a, an idealized heart, and uh, this is still an idealized ventricle. Uh, this is to see the way the flow behaves in the, in, in, the, in the ventricle. This is a physiological heartbeat. You see the formation of vortices. You have primary vortices and secondary vortices. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is very important because you want to tune your model and to make sure that your model is uh, responding correctly, at least by reproducing the macroscopic behaviors. Uh, then you can, of course, afford more uh, challenging uh, um, simulations. This is a real uh, ventricle from a real uh, person. It's, of course, reconstructed uh, geometrically, but it's also reconstructed physically because there are fibers and sheets in the ventricle, sorry, in the, uh, in the myocardium. And, and, and you cannot get them from uh, the uh, medical imaging, at least not yet these days. So you have to reconstruct them mathematically, and then you can solve the problem. And when you solve the problem, you can simulate either the physiological conditions, as before, or pathological conditions. What you see here is a real heart from a real patient, and uh, you see the uh, propagation of the uh, uh, potential, the potential uh, on this heart, uh, and this is, of course, is a pathological behavior. It's kind of uh, 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 arrhythmic behavior of the heart. It's, uh, it has a name, it's LBBB, it's left bundle branch block. Um, it's important to get this type of information because uh, there is no way otherwise to, to capture this type of malfunctioning. And you probably know that in those cases, what is done is a, is a scar, it's just cutting a piece of, of, of heart to, uh, to break the propagation of. Uh, the electric field from the upper fiber to the lower fiber, and where to cut it is very important, and how, how, how much you have to cut is also extremely important. So this is done by pure art from the doctors these days, and, uh, and hopefully this mathematical investigation would help them to have more specific information on the critical sites. Uh, this is the most complicated uh, or complex uh, simulation that we have so far, because uh, here are simulating not only the interaction between the uh, fluid and, and, the, and the heart, uh, but also the opening and the closing of uh, the aortic valve. And this is a very fast dynamic, as, as you can imagine. So this is, a, this is taking forever. It's a computation that is really very demanding, and that's why it's so important to try to reduce this type of complexity. So I'd like to devote the, uh, this last part of my talk uh, to uh, this uh, uh, strategy to uh, uh, reduce complexity, and, uh, uh, and the strategy is based on the so-called reduced basis method. Uh, now, let me first of all try to say in which context we are going to apply this type of strategy. Uh, we would like to describe the diversity, diversity of people, uh, diversity of patients. I mean, every single part of our body is characterized by many parameters, uh, which are medical parameters, we have different shape, physical parameters, uh, the composition of our blood, uh, the composition of our uh, uh, tissue, and, uh, and the metabolic response, and so on and so forth. So very often, uh, you have to deal with uh, uh, many parameters. And uh, when you plug all these parameters into your system of partial differential equations, of course, the response uh, changes, and, uh, and every time you should have to undergo this type of very difficult simulations. Uh, so how to get rid of this parameter dependence, or how to take advantage of this parameter dependence uh, by, by a mathematically sound approach. To oversimplify my talk uh, here, let me just um, make it very abstract, or very general. Uh, let me talk about parameterized partial differential equations. Assume that we have a set of parameters uh, in, uh, in, in, in RP, R to the power P, and then you have an operator, 
linear or non-linear, um, then uh, uh, this operator might depend on parameters. It goes from a Hilbert space to its dual, and uh, we want to solve this PDE. Uh, for every mu in P, we want to find the solution U of mu in, a, in, a, in the Hilbert space V, such that L times U equal to F in V prime in the dual space. Now, L may depend on mu, F might depend on mu, F is the set of data, and, and then, of course, U will depend on mu. Of course, you can go with the, with the weak formulation of this problem. Uh, parameters could be physical, material coefficients, fluid properties, source boundary terms are possible source of parameters, but it could also be geometrical. We want to characterize the geometry of a single uh, piece. It could be, of course, an artery, it could be uh, the, an airfoil, it could be a, any, any kind of uh, object. Uh, this is one example. Uh, this is a bypass um, that is an artificial uh, um, bridge that is created between an LT artery and an LT uh, uh, upstream and another LT artery downstream to, to bypass a, an occlusion, a blockage, like here. So you have different ways you can realize it. Uh, first of all, the thickness, uh, the diameter, say, this is decided by the doctor, uh, the angle between the hosting artery and this uh, prosthetic artery, and, uh, and, and these, again, are design parameters that are decided by the doctor. And, uh, and uh, on top of that, of course, you have physical parameters. For instance, the Reynolds number, which is uh, an indicator of, the, uh, of uh, how healthy is the uh, flow field there. It's related to the velocity and to the viscosity of blood. And then the inlet velocity. And, um, and, and this is important because uh, we, we make um, an operation today on the basis of... Uh, a partial blockage today, but you like this to be an optimal operation, an optimal shape design, and you like it to be robust because in the next coming months and years, the situation of this patient will change. So this is a robust, optimal design. So there's plenty of room for mathematical, uh, mathematical ideas, of course. Um, uh, the um, uh, parameterization is used also for the pre so-called pre-design. This is an airfoil. And uh, uh, you want, for instance, in this case, to optimize the, uh, the lift. Just to make an example, the airfoil can be characterized in this case, a very simple simulation, by three parameters, the, the length, the thickness, and the angle of attack. So you, you want to solve this problem for uh, very, very many different uh, combinations of those parameters. How can we take advantage of a mathematics, say, in order to uh, be able to uh, speed up this computation. Uh, very generally speaking, uh, we are dealing with many query problems. Uh, you want to explore the solution space corresponding to a broad range of parameters. You want to solve optimal control problems or inverse problems or uncertain quantification problems. And in all those cases, you have to solve the state equation and the joint equation many, many times. And eventually, we like to go with real-time computing. So the dream is to have all these simulations available on a smart platform for the doctor in real time. OK, uh, back to the mathematics. We have our parameterized PDE, and, uh, and we have the possibility of solving the parameterized PDE for every given value of the parameter by, uh, say, what engineers call a high-fidelity method. High-fidelity method is the best method you can have in-house to produce solutions that are accurate. So assume that you are using finite elements or finite volumes or spectral methods, any kind of method which, is, uh, which can deliver very accurate solutions. So identify this method as the solution as H, UH. H typically is the grid size. So this is the high fidelity problem. Ideally, if you have infinitely many resources and uh, infinitely much time, you, can, you like to solve your problem by uh, a high fidelity solver for any value of the parameter mu. In fact, you cannot do it. So, you have to replace this high fidelity problem by a problem which is much, much smaller to solve. Just to give you an idea, uh, we want to solve a problem with uh, tens, sometimes hundreds of millions of degrees of freedom, meaning that the system has a size which is of hundreds of millions of, uh, say, if it, if it, if it is a, a linear PDE, the corresponding matrix should be of hundreds of millions of variables, of columns and, 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 uh, and the rows. Um, now, I assume that you have a good uh, mathematical setting for this high fidelity model. Namely, you have uh, a stable and a convergent algorithm uh, or a method, say. Uh, you want to replace it by a much smaller problem that we call 
uh, reduced basis uh, problem. And uh, we will denote it with this uh, subindex N. So LN UN equal to FN will be our reduced very small problem. How do you go from the gigantic problem to the small problem without losing too much information? This is the issue. Um, let me show an example. Uh, let me show first of all an example and you see what you can get out of this example. This is a very simple system. Uh, this is a heat exchanger. Uh, you want to uh, cool uh, uh, a, a fluid, say, into uh, this uh, system uh, by uh, using these uh, uh, baffles and by keeping these baffles at a given temperature. Um, so you have several parameters. Three of them are the temperature, uh, the constant temperature uh, that you want to operate on these baffles, and, and the fourth is uh, the so-called Pickler number. The Pickler number uh, has to see with the uh, convective uh, dominance of, uh, of the fluid, say, is a physical parameter. So you have four parameters that are spanning a very big set of parameters in R4, and the underlying system is a, is a, is a partial differential equation. It's an advection diffusion uh, uh, system, uh, in advection diffusion partial differential equation, actually. So um, uh, we want to explore all these set of parameters, and here is the way uh, you can, uh, you can uh, operate. Uh, there is a manifold. This is the solution manifold that we indicate with MH. What is MH? Uh, this is the manifold uh, which is identified by the solution of the high fidelity problem. And this parameterized by mu, of course. So ideally, you like to reconstruct the old manifold. In practice, this is impossible. Uh, so what you do is to make a proper selection of the parameters. Assume that you have a magic way to select the parameters, some of them, say, and uh, correspondingly to compute the high fidelity solution. So this is one example, right? Mu1, and then you, you, you compute your finite element solution. Uh, and, and this is done offline, once and for all. So this would be one point of your manifold. Then you pick up a second value, and uh, you get UH of mu2, and then a third, and the fourth, and the, and the n value, and assume that you stop at n, and of course you need to know when to stop, so you need a mathematical uh, uh, criterion to guide you in uh, deciding which is the number of parameters. So in that case, you are computing offline a set of representative solutions. Uh, we call them snapshots. Then we use these uh, snapshots, you take linear combination of those snapshots after normalization, say, and you generate a, 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 a subspace. Okay? So this is a very simple case in which you have just one single parameter. So the manifold is just one line. Otherwise, it would be uh, an hypersurface. But still, for this case, you have, you have this uh, subspace. And uh, this is the subspace of dimension n. Typically, n is of the order of 10 or 20 or 30, say, very small compared with the... Uh, hundreds of millions of variables that we have seen before. And, uh, and then, if you have a new, uh, we call Vn the span of these, uh, of these snapshots, and if you have a new value of the parameter now, say a new patient, in this case is a new type of set of temperature, say, uh, then uh, uh, instead of computing the solution with the high fidelity model, you compute the solution with this uh, a low fidelity model, with this set, the solution in this uh, subspace, which is very small, by projecting the original partial differential equation onto this subspace. So basically we are using a Galerkin projection onto the subspace, which, have, which has a very low dimension, say. So this takes nothing. This takes few seconds on a, on a laptop, because if you have, or even less, if you have a system of 20 by 20 or 30 by 30, this is just a real-time solution, right? Of course, uh, you have to, uh, to see uh, whether you are operating nicely and accurately. But let me try to explain this approach at a pure algebraic level without, say, manifolds and subspaces. You have the high fidelity system, which is the finite element system, AH, UH equal to FH. AH is this gigantic matrix A. And then you have uh, the snapshot of solution that feed this matrix here, V. So V is a matrix whose columns are uh, the values of uh, the nodal values, say, of uh, the uh, snapshots. Uh, so it's a rectangular matrix. Um, 
then uh, you make a, a guess that your solution UH is well represented by V time UN, and of course you have to look for UN in this subspace. Um, this means that you are transforming the original problem in this way. You replace UH by VUN, and then uh, you have a rectangular system, and you make it square and small by multiplication by V transpose. V transpose means that you are making a Galerkin projection to the subspace. So this is the new system, and the new system is a small one. You see, AN is an N by N matrix. So it's very microscopic matrix, and, uh, and this is a very microscopic system that you can solve uh, online. So offline, you generate a snapshot once and for all. Offline, you go to the clinics. You have hundreds of patients. You want to make the simulation for every single patient. It might take for weeks. It does not matter. Then you create your library of patients, of snapshots, say. And then when, when you have a new patient online, you can compute the solution for this new patient by solving a problem in the subspace of the solution generated by the previous patient. That's the idea. So offline might take forever. Online, but you have a very rich library. Online, or dictionary say, online it takes for nothing. It's very it's kind of immediate, immediate computation that you can carry on. OK. Um, let me just give you a flavor of the type of uh, accuracy that you can reach by doing this type, by using this type of process. Uh, this is the uh, heat exchanger that I've shown before. Uh, this is the number of uh, reduced basis solutions of snapshots, say. Uh, we go from uh, 1 to 31, and we stop at 31, because in this case, we have a tolerance that we fixed a priori of 10 to the power minus 6. Uh, so we have, when we have that our error is below 10 to the power minus 6, we stop. This is just one choice. And what you see here is the behavior of the error. What is the error? The error is the difference between the solution the reduced basis solution, the one that you get very quickly, and the true solution. And this curve is uh, uh, behavior, behaving exponentially, meaning that uh, the error decays to zero exponentially fast with respect to the number of basis functions that you are using. The number of basis functions is the number of snapshots, and eventually is the number is the, the size of the matrix. Right. So you have exponential convergence. And in this specific case, to get a true finite element solution, we take 3.5 seconds on this uh, computer. And to get the uh, reduced basis solution for the same problem, it takes one millisecond. So there's a, there's a factor of gain, which is of the order of 10, to the power, 10 to the power 3. Now, it's not the 3.5 seconds which are uh, disturbing, but are the two weeks of computation for a single heartbeat that, does not, that are not affordable. How can you get such a great result, mathematically speaking? Well, uh, you need to, uh, first of all, uh, make sure that you select properly the snapshots, namely the uh, original parameters. Uh, they should be as um, um, meaningful as possible. And of course, you need an algorithm for that, which is the greedy algorithm. Uh, alternatively, you may use the POD, the proper term of the composition, but it's much more demanding in terms of computational resources. And, um, and this is one ingredient of the success. And the second one is that the manifold should be smooth as a function of the parameters. So you, you need the smoothness of the manifold, and you need uh, a, a good algorithm. Um, the greedy algorithm, uh, it, it produces, uh, you start from mu1, and how you compute mu2, mu2, and mu2, mu3, and mu1. Well, at every step, uh, at the step n, you take the span of the snapshots that you have computed previously, and you compute the new mu n plus 1 as the one that maximizes the distance between uh, the reduced basis solution and uh, the uh, ideal high fidelity solution for every possible value of the parameter p. This is the greedy algorithm. Um, it's uh, an optimal algorithm in terms of accuracy, but unfortunately, it's practically uh, useless because, because at every step, you have to uh, compute the solution, the reduced basis solution, and compare it with the, uh, with the uh, high fidelity solution for every value of the parameters. This is mathematically brilliant, but practically useless. So what you do is uh, rather a so-called weak greedy algorithm. 
instead of, uh, instead of uh, computing the real error, you compute uh, an error estimator. This is a posterior error analysis, very classical in, uh, in, uh, in numerical approximation of PDEs. So you have an error indicator, which is based on the residual. So this is something that you can actually compute. And secondly, we replace the whole set of parameters by a, a training set, which contains many parameters, but is a discrete set. So by so doing, you keep the same properties, uh, asymptotical properties of the, of, the, uh, of the greedy algorithm, and, and you have an algorithm that is uh, actually very, very efficient. Okay, it's a bit of mathematics. Uh, the very last thing is about the dimensionality of the uh, manifold. Uh, of course, this works if uh, the manifold is smooth. Um, now, you like it, you like to see how complicated is the manifold. And in particular, one indicator of its complexity is the so-called Kolmogorov n width. What is the Kolmogorov n width? Well, n means uh, n is an integer. Uh, so assume that we fix n equal to 10, right? So what is the Kolmogorov 10 width of mh? It is the best possible error that you can achieve by approximating the whole manifold by a subspace of dimension 10. Okay? So you want to approximate it by a linear subspace of dimension 10. Uh, this is the Kolmogorov and width. <laughs> now, uh, there are very few results on the Kolmogorov and width. Uh, I mean, results of practical interest. Uh, one of those is this one. If the high fidelity solution depends analytically on the parameters, then the Kolmogorov and width decays exponentially fast with respect to n. Meaning that you may, you know that you could, in principle, find the subspace of dimension n uh, with this very small n, which is a very good approximation of the whole manifold. But how do you compute it? Well, it, it turns out that the greedy algorithm, which selects the snapshots that you use to compute the subspace, is a, is a very good uh, strategy to produce uh, such an optimal uh, uh, subspace. And, uh, and in fact, you can show that uh, with the greedy algorithm, with the weak greedy algorithm, the, the approximate Kolmogorov and width is very close to the real one. Uh, so you still have exponential convergence uh, by using the greedy algorithm uh, if uh, the Kolmogorov and width uh, uh, was uh, exponential, uh, exponentially k to zero when n goes to infinity. So the, uh, the end of the story is that if your problem is uh, uh, a solution that uh, behave nicely with respect to mu, mu are the parameters, then uh, using the reduced basis method with a greedy algorithm to produce the snapshots is uh, the right way to go because you can end up with a solution which is uh, fast and accurate. Uh, this is the fastest uh, solution that we have so far. Uh, this is a, still a, a carotid bifurcation. Uh, we are simulating now with reduced basis um, functions uh, the, uh, a single heartbeat. And we see here that it takes 0 0.1 second of computational time to simulate one heartbeat that is uh, it's happening over 0 0.8 seconds of physical time. So this is more than real time. And this is because of the fact that we are using this reduced basis element method. Remember that for the same type of simulation before, it took us for the order of one week on a big supercomputer. This computation is made on a laptop. And that's why we hope that this would be eventually useful for doctors. And this is the, I'm going to close with that. This is the final paradigm. Uh, we, we use big supercomputers and the, 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 the full strength of analysis and of numerical analysis and, and of uh, scientific computing to generate high quality solutions. These are the snapshots. And then once you have this, uh, we, uh, and we have a new patient or we have a new simulation to make, we want to use the projection onto the subspace and then uh, uh, using a real-time solution uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a smart, on a smart object here, on a smart platform. And, uh, and this is possible because you are taking advantage of the pre-computed solutions offline. So all what is uh, high fidelity, all what is mathematically sophisticated, all what is very demanding in terms of computational time is made offline once and for all, and, uh, and then uh, online you want to make sure that you have a solution that is extremely fast and that can be used in real time. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to stop here.
Thank you very much for your talk. Questions, comments, remarks? Yeah. So that's a question with respect to the uh, the greedy uh, the greedy algorithm when the when this parameter mu describes a geometry like you know with this airfoil, you would have linear. I mean, the linear space would depend on mu. So how do you how do you deal with this? I mean, then when I mean, do you do you kind of re-express everything on the same domain? Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's a very pertinent question. All the computations are made on a domain which is parameter independent. So the very first step is to transform your equation into a, a corresponding equation in the reference domain. The reference domain is parameter independent. So in particular, the geometry is taking care about this type of step.